There are a lot of discussions online about best practices for data storage and backups, but overall I found those to be too conceptual, too advanced, or simply too cost prohibitive for the average individual or very small business, and generally focus on specific components of the process rather than looking at it holistically. I wanted to create a simple and actionable guide focusing on affordable solutions with just enough context to understand how everything actually works. Data should exist in a minimum of two places at once, three is better. One of those needs to be off-site. RAID is not a backup. Your third backup will ideally not be live synced. I'll show a recommended common setup at the end of the video. Finally, this video is about data management and it does not cover advanced cybersecurity implementation. First, let's take a look at the different local storage and backup storage options. There are two main types of storage, NAS or network attached storage, and DAS or direct attached storage. NAS, as the name implies, is storage that you access over a network. For the purpose of this video, I won't be covering NAS setups, as setting up offsite backups for these can get complicated and expensive, and setting up infrastructure to be able to work directly off your NAS drive with high bitrate files can get fairly involved. So instead, I'll focus on direct attached storage either internal or external drives attached directly to your computer. This would include the hard drives inside your computer, USB and Thunderbolt drives, and DAS multi-drive enclosures with and without RAID configuration. There are two main types of drives available depending on your needs and your budget. SSDs or solid state drives, fast storage like what's typically inside your MacBook, and your classic HHDs or hard disk drives, your typical spinning disks. In terms of pure cost efficiency to performance balance, it's usually best to use a combination of the two. SSDs for your operating system and project drives, and anything else that needs fast data throughput. And spinning disks for general storage, project archiving, and backups. Basically stuff where a slower drive won't bottleneck your workflow. Spinning disks have much higher recoverability and the chance of hardware failure, but SSDs are less likely to fail due to not having moving parts. A spinning hard drive is literally spinning multiple magnetic platters with moving needles that read the data from the disk. These mechanical parts can eventually fail and in particular are very susceptible to knocks and bumps. Not all spinning disks are created equal. They come in two main sizes, 2.5 inch and 3.5 inch, and two main speeds, 5400 RPM and 7200 RPM. Generally, I recommend 7200 RPM 3.5 inch disks. A lot of the bigger disks from 8TB and up seem to be enterprise-grade disks these days too, which is a nice addition for durability. One more thing to look for with spinning drives is the cache size. You generally want to go with drives with at least a 256MB cache, as these are more likely to be CMR-based as opposed to SMR. CMR-based drives are generally considered to be much better for maintaining speeds during large data transfers. SSDs are much faster, quieter, power efficient, and less prone to mechanical failure. However, they're currently still fairly cost prohibitive to use for storing large amounts of data. Also, if they do fail, data recovery can be near impossible. For external drives, make sure to check not only the speed of the drive itself, but also the speed of the connector. You want at least USB 3 for maintaining reasonable speeds, and ideally Thunderbolt 3 or higher if you plan to daisy chain multiple drives. You're probably familiar with what RAID is. If not, RAID, or Redundant Array of Independent Disks, is a data storage virtualization technology that combines multiple physical disk drive components into one or more logical units for the purposes of data redundancy, performance improvement, or both. Basically, between the different levels of RAID, you can do things like making two drives mirror each other in real time, protecting against mechanical failure of the drive, or making two drives appear as a single drive. The combined size of both drives, and double the speed, but at the cost of two times higher mechanical failure probability. It's important to note that while certain RAID configurations can definitely protect against mechanical failures of drives, there are many other things that can go wrong with your data. Therefore, for the sake of this video, I won't be considering RAID as a backup in and of itself. Unless you need more than 16 terabytes of total storage on a single drive, or have specific speed or storage configuration needs that can't be accomplished on a single drive, I'd probably just steer away from RAID setups altogether. When choosing storage solutions, remember that you need twice as much physical storage as you have storage requirements. For example, if you need 8TB of storage, you need a minimum of two drives with 8TB of storage on them each. More typically though, it would be split between solid state drives and hard drives in a configuration like a 2TB SSD that stores your active projects that you need to be able to load quickly, then a 6TB spinning drive that holds your general storage and archived files and then an 8TB spinning drive that you back those other two drives onto. Before you start worrying about how to manage all of that data, I've got that covered in the next section. 
Now that you've got all your files stored and you've got an equal amount of drive space to back everything up onto, what you don't want to start doing is your typical drag and drop, manual, accept, merge, update or replace, manual backup mess. Instead, I recommend file syncing software. There's quite a few options available, but my personal favorite is Free File Sync. Free File Sync is platform agnostic, meaning you can use it on a Mac, Windows or Linux, and it's completely free and open source. There's an option to donate on the website, so if you end up liking this software, that helps development and future updates. I have no personal affiliation with Free File Sync, I just really like the software. Free File Sync can look a little bit daunting when you first open it up, but I assure you, once you get your head around it, it's a really powerful tool. If you get stuck, there are tutorials on their official website. The way I recommend setting it up for a basic backup is, for checking what to update, compare, file time and size. This keeps the checking speeds reasonable as opposed to reading 100% of the actual data. This is based on the file list, so it works super fast. And for sync, I choose synchronize update. This means that it only copies in one direction, to the backup drive. Then you simply just select which drives or folders you want to back up and where you want to back them up to and then click Synchronize Update. There will sometimes be some errors, but these are usually just cache files and other things that don't need to be backed up. I suggest skim reading the error log to make sure there's nothing critical being skipped. Once it's scanned, it'll tell you how many files it wants to update. If it all looks fine, you can go ahead and click Start, and it will update your backup drive to mirror the originals. You can save this backup process as a configuration, so you don't have to do it all manually next time, and you know it'll do it exactly the same every time you do it. This is also super useful in the event that your backups require more than one step of data transfer. There are options for versioning, scheduled backups, and much more in Free File Sync. But for the purposes of this video, I recommend doing it the manual way I just showed. This means that you'll only back up when you want to and when your computer isn't busy doing something else. The other actually very important added benefit of doing it this way is that if you do corrupt a file, it won't automatically override the corrupted file onto your backup so you'll have a much better chance at restoring a working version of that file. This is actually the main difference between synced and non-synced backups. As a final note, it's really important that you maintain the file structure of your drives. If you start moving around root folders and changing path names, you'll end up with duplicate backups on your target drive. Once Free File Sync is all set up, it's incredibly easy to back everything up. Certainly much, much easier than doing it all manually. For offsite backups, cloud based backup specific storage solutions are ideal. While it's possible to have an offsite hard drive that you use for backing up that you ship to a friend or relative out of town periodically and then have them ship it back and then you update it, or a server or NAS that you connect to remotely, that's generally not the path of release resistance for very small businesses. So instead, I'd recommend cloud backups. You might have looked at the eye watering prices of backup solutions such as Google Drive, Dropbox, iCloud, and if you have less than two terabytes worth of storage that you're dealing with, these can still be viable solutions. But they're typically designed for super fast download and upload, and those are both things we don't typically need for our offsite redundancy backup. There are much cheaper solutions you can use with this instead. I personally use and recommend Backblaze. Backblaze basically gives you unlimited cloud storage for a fixed comparatively low price, which can sync either in real time or on a scheduled backup depending on your own personal requirements. The price for the unlimited Backblaze personal plan at the time of making this video is 70 US dollars per year. And that's considerably cheaper than any of the fast access cloud storage options I've looked at. I don't have any ties to Backblaze, I just really like the service. However, if you use the link in the description, you can sign up for a free 15 day trial. Quick disclosure, I get a small commission for any sales through this link at no extra cost to you which really helps with making videos like this. So please consider using the link in the description or go to hendrikusdevan.com forward slash backblaze. The upload and download speeds on a backblaze personal plan are much slower than most other cloud storage, especially when accessing it from outside of the US. However, this isn't really a problem because you'll only ever have to access this backup if both of your local drives fail. Also, if you have an enormous amount of files, it can take over a week for your first backup to fully complete. Don't worry about it, that's totally normal, just check in on it periodically. I recommend keeping Backblaze set to a continuous backup as opposed to scheduled. Now that everything's all backed up, if you do suffer a catastrophic failure and lose both of your local drives, you can either download all of your files onto a new hard drive, but this will be quite slow if you have multiple terabytes of data. The better option would be to use the service Backblaze offers where they put your files onto an external hard drive with end-to-end -end encryption and physically mail it out to you. That way you don't have to download terabytes of data. The service does cost a little bit of money to cover the cost of the drives, 
At the time of this video, the cost of the hard drive restore option is 189 US dollars, including shipping. But if you don't want to keep the drives, you can ship them back to Backblaze for a refund once you're done copying the files back onto your own storage. On their website, it says that the drives are limited to 8 terabytes with a maximum of 7 terabytes of storage. But I spoke to the team at Backblaze and they assured me that if the amount of data you're trying to restore is greater than 7 terabytes, they can ship you out multiple drives. Although you do need to pay for each drive. But again, you can get this refunded if you ship them back within 30 days of them shipping. I also asked them specifically which drives they ship because quality and speed are important to me. They responded the following. Except for the Samsung flash slash thumb drives at 256 gigabytes, they're all three and a half inch drives. The drives we send are one terabyte, two terabyte, four terabyte Western Digital My Passports, or six terabyte, eight terabyte Western Digital My Books. One very important thing to note with the Backblaze personal plan is that it'll only back up and keep backed up currently attached DAS storage. It keeps your backups for 30 days, so if you have a portable drive that you want backed up, it's important that you connect it to your computer regularly and for long enough for a full backup to be completed. This also means, and very importantly, that NAS drives will not work with this particular plan. There are other plans available from both Backblaze and other companies that do cover NAS drives, but as far as I can tell, they're all pay per terabyte plans and can get quite expensive for large amounts of storage. They're typically aimed more for enterprise solutions. It really depends on your needs and your personal risk tolerance. For most people though, two local copies and a Backblaze personal plan would put you well ahead of the curve for comparatively very little money. It's good to note as well that although this plan is technically unlimited, it's probably not suitable for enterprise quantities of data. If you have too much data to back everything up within the 30 day period, it's probably better to move up to an enterprise grade plan. In practical terms, if you have a gigabit fiber connection, I'd consider this for an absolute maximum 32 terabytes worth of total storage. Finally, it's important to note that just like any other online service you use, it's incredibly important to set up two-factor authentication to make sure that your data is secure. Right, so that's a fair bit of information and it might be hard to visualize how it all comes together. I find it particularly useful to draw what I like to call a backup tree. Basically, it's a way to visualize all of the drives that you want to back up where you want to back them up to and how. I start by drawing all of the drives I want to back up on the left. And then on the other side, I put all the destinations for the backups. From here, you can start to draw traces between them and label them with the method of backup. I find this to be the most simple and easy way to make big picture decisions for how you're going to do your backups. I thought I'd wrap this video up firstly by showing you how I've implemented all of this in my own setup, and then a setup that I would recommend for most people. In professional post-production terms, my current setup is considered pretty minimal. It only has a storage capacity of 16 terabytes, with a total hard drive space of just over 32 terabytes. But that's plenty of storage for most photographers or filmmakers who mostly work with lower bitrate files on shorter form content. If I do end up working with more cinema cameras or on longer form content, I'm going to have to rethink my setup a little bit, but most of my drives will be able to be repurposed. My setup is built around a Mac Mini and I just have it tidied away in a little server cabinet which keeps things cool, quiet and gets rid of the clutter on my desk. For the working drives, I have two separate RAID arrays inside one OWC Thunder Bay Mini. The first array is a 4TB SSD RAID 0 array. I use this for my working drive. It's big enough that I can run several projects at once from it and fast enough to work directly from it. The second array is an 8TB 2.5 inch spinning disk RAID 0 array. This is for asset storage and archiving projects too. It's not particularly fast and I would have been better off using a single 3.5 inch disk with a higher speed. However, I had a few 4 terabyte external hard drives laying around and I didn't want to waste them so I just shucked them and put them in a RAID array. I also get projects from clients on Samsung T5 external SSDs, so I usually have one of those plugged in too. I have an ongoing client whose drive is plugged in permanently and added to my overall backup strategy. This particular drive also gets periodically backed up to their unlimited Google Drive storage. However, that service is only available for large-scale enterprises. I find these drives plenty fast to work from for low bitrate projects. I have another 500 gigabyte T5 drive that gets used as a cache and proxy drive. This one doesn't get backed up. Finally, my backup disk is a Seagate expansion 16 terabyte USB 3 drive. People have pulled these open and found out they actually have an enterprise grade Seagate Exos helium filled drive in them. Depending on the sales on at the time of purchase, if you wanted to put these drives in a multi-drive enclosure, the external drives are actually sometimes cheaper than the bare drives. You can just break the enclosure off and then put the bare drives inside your multi-drive enclosure. This process is called shucking. 
do note that shucking your drives will completely void your warranty, so that's something to take into consideration if you're going down that route. These 16 terabyte drives are actually super fast. In fact, they're fast enough that I likely wouldn't bother with RAID anymore if I only needed 16 terabytes of storage. Two of these drives in RAID 0 would likely be fast enough for most people to work directly from, at which point you might not even need SSDs. It really depends on the type of work you're doing and how much RAM you're running. One last note on these drives, they're super loud. So much so that when I first got mine, I thought it was faulty. They crunch and vibrate. However, we have a whole bunch of these drives now and they all sound exactly the same. So I'm guessing that it's totally normal and they're just designed to live in a server room somewhere. Although my wife's drives just live on a desk and once she got used to it, she doesn't really seem to be that bothered by it anymore. But just something to take into consideration if you're easily bothered by noises. And of course I manage all my file syncing and free file sync. I have it set up for a single button press backup of all of my drives. And then finally everything live syncs to Backblaze. I'm pretty happy with this setup. I could maybe see myself switching out the Thunder Bay Mini for one of their larger enclosures and filling it with the 16 terabyte drives and then loading up the Thunder Bay Mini with more SSDs instead. That being said, I can see this setup lasting me a couple more years before I even need to think about upgrading. Finally, I wanted to make a recommendation for a really simple but robust and affordable setup that would likely suit most people. My wife, who's a retoucher, asked me to rebuild a data storage setup recently. We wanted to figure out the most cost-effective solution that would still offer a premium level of performance. We've had this setup running for a couple of months now and we found it to be both reliable and running to spec. I think this is the setup that would probably suit most videographers, content creators, and photographers alike. It consists of either a one terabyte or two terabyte Samsung T5 drive to use as your main scratch disk, a 16 terabyte Seagate as your main storage drive, another 16 terabyte Seagate as your backup drive, then using free file sync, back up the T5 and storage drive onto your backup drive, and then sync everything to Backblaze. This way you have three copies of your files backed up with two copies locally. For an extra layer of protection, you can additionally back up the files from your scratch disk to your storage drive, but this is likely not needed for most people and will unnecessarily complicate the process. You could go smaller on the spinning drives, however the 16 terabyte ones that Seagate are selling at the moment are super fast. And considering that they're enterprise grade drives, they offer a pretty amazing cost to performance ratio. But if you only need four terabytes or so of storage, just look for any high quality 3.5 inch 7200 RPM drives. This setup would protect your data from the main types of data loss. Mechanical drive failure, fire or burglary, natural disaster, electromagnetic pulse. As a final note, and this probably goes without saying, but never move a spinning drive around while it's spinning. That's a short way to significantly increase your chance of disk failure. I had a couple of questions come in through Instagram and I answered most throughout the course of this video, but there was one from Lucy Alcorn asking about a daily, weekly, monthly checklist of when to do what. The main thing is to update your local backup fairly regularly. To decide on exactly how often to do it, you just need to ask yourself, how many hours of work can I reasonably afford to lose? Remember the files are being live synced to Backblaze as well, but of course nothing beats being able to pull your files from a local drive. I usually back my own files up either once a week or every time I complete a major save or milestone on a project, whichever one comes first. Other than that, I just recommend that once a fortnight you check that your automatic backups to Backblaze are working correctly. And then not a question, but a point that was brought up by Zenju, the person behind Free File Sync. They mentioned that if backups are done using hard drives, sooner or later these need to be migrated to newer or bigger media. In this case, the data needs to be copied over. However, it matters which of the three logically equivalent drives is used as a source. You always need to pick the drive you're replacing as the source, not one of the other two. This matters if there's data corruption on one of the drives and you'll absolutely want to avoid it from spreading. I think this issue is easy to miss because it's often more convenient to use the same hard disk drive as source that is available nearby, copy to the new drive and then swap this drive with the to be replaced backup. But this risks propagating corrupted data. It's important to do your own research to decide what your own personal data risk tolerance is and if your current backup solutions meet that tolerance, both conceptually as well as in hardware and service quality. But for most people that aren't working on super demanding, big budget projects, the ideas I laid out should see you right. If you found this video helpful, please consider liking and subscribing and also share it around with other creatives. Thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.